Well, it happened every year. It happened every year I was in junior high school. The, the administration would separate the boys and the girls, and they would show us these films on sex education. The girls' film, I never saw it, was called From Girl to Woman. The boys' film was called From Boy to Man, and it was really kind of a, a funny thing because we would go into the cafeteria every single year and, and, and watch this movie. And there was a guy named Jim who was the star of the show, and, and I'll never forget him. He had this, he had this plaid short sleeve shirt on, a pair of Levi 501s, black high top tennis shoes, and it showed him playing basketball, you know. And then, then the announcer would start, the announcer would say, notice Jim, see the muscularity, the peach fuzz on his chin. Notice his voice changing. And Jim would be like, pass me the ball. <laughs> and then Jim would walk into his house and grab a, a, a big jug of milk and begin to drink the milk, you know, out of the milk bottle. And the announcer would come on, he would say, Jim is now being interested in girls, the opposite sex. And, and it showed him going over to the phone and dialing this number and and, and the announcer would go, let's listen in. Jim was like, hey, Sally, uh, we have dance this Friday night, and I was wondering if you could go with me. <laughs> you can? Neato. You know, it was kind of a black and white film, kind of a 19, I don't know, late 50s, early 60s rendition. And then <laughs> the most hilarious part was it would show Jim kind of kicking back in, in the chair after he had secured the date with Sally. And, and, and the announcer, this was so cruel, would say, notice Jim's armpits. See the rings of sweat under them. Jim is entering puberty. And then it would stop and kind of build and the music would, would begin and then the announcer would say, Jim is moving from boy to man, man, man. And then, bum, 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 bum. From boy to man, bum, 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 bum. This film teaches you the principles and precepts of puberty, bum, 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 bum. And I would watch that film every single year and I don't know, it left an indelible impression on my life. I've never forgotten Jim. But you know, Jim sort of lived a sad existence, didn't he? Because he, he was constantly paused on puberty. He never, he never got out of puberty. He never, he never matured, wore the, wore the same outfit every year, the same you know, shoes and everything. He was paused on puberty. Well, today, the, the headlines of, of this talk is, is being paused on puberty because as, as I look around the landscape of, of, our, of our world today, I see a lot of people who were paused on puberty. Now, adolescence is a great thing to go through, right? We, we, we all go through it. One day we're just walking down the primrose path of life and this testosterone tidal wave hits us or this estrogen eruption occurs and we're like, whoa, what's happening to my body? And, and, and we go through those, those awkward teenage years. And the thing that's so interesting about being a teenager is that's got to be the only time in life, the only stage in life where we think we're bulletproof. Do you know what I'm saying? We think we're omniscient and omnipotent. We think that, that we're above and beyond anybody and everything. Talk to most teenagers and they'll tell you, Anybody over 35 is clueless, and anybody over 50 is comatose. That's just, that's just the way it is. It's hard to tell teenagers anything, because if you can remember back to when you were a teenager, or maybe we've got some teenagers in the house, I know we do in all of our campuses, maybe just maybe you remember that, and you're like, you know what? I thought I knew everything. But, but now, as I look back on that transitional stage, that's the key word, transitional stage, I realize I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. And, and that's a big, big key. Because when you look at Scripture, Scripture compares physical development and spiritual development. If you look at the book of Hebrews, for example, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, the writer tells us to go on to maturity. I love that to go on 
to maturity. So to get to it, we've got to go through it. Say that with me. To get to it, we've got to go through it. And adolescence is a stage we've got to get through. It's a wonderful stage, an exciting stage, a stage of life and energy and, and a whole new world opens up to us. However, it's, it's dangerous though when we become paused on puberty like Jim, when we just wear the proverbial plaid short sleeve shirt and 501s and black high top sneakers in a black and white film for the rest of our existence. There, there's more for us out there. And, and, and that's why the scriptures say for us to go on to maturity. There are basically several stages of spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity, we've been discovering, is available for all of us. It's not just reserved for a few. It's not just reserved for the Billy Grahams or the Mother Teresas out there or the Bible teachers or, or, or this man or this woman or, or, or someone else. It's reserved for every single person. The, the first phase has got to be the infancy phase. And, and, and that's what we talked about last time, the playpen whining, Gerber dining, nap timing mentality. You, you're, you're just born again. You're in your spiritual pampers, so to speak. It's your parents' desire for you to mature. Uh, they feed you and, and, and they want to teach you and train you how to feed yourself. And then from there, from stage one, we move into stage two. Stage two is this spiritual puberty, this, this spiritual adolescence that we all go through. But, I, but I've got to say, I think more people live in puberty. More people press the pause button in this stage of development than in any other stage, because the next stage is the mature stage. That's the spiritual parent stage. And, and, and how do you know that you're mature? Well, you don't have to say it, People just know it because you show it. Jesus said, I will know my followers by the fruit that they produce. Jesus is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. When you have intimacy and worship, the result is reproduction. And, and so often people will say, oh, it was so deep. The glory of God fell the worship was intense, and, and those times are rich times. They're wonderful times. But I always ask this question, where are the babies? What about the kids? Because if it's true biblical intimacy, you're going to have a lot of babies. And that's one of the beautiful things about this house, about this work, about this church, is we've got a bunch of babies out there. But how do we move, though, that, that, that's the question, from the pacifier stage to the puberty stage? And how do we move from the puberty stage to the maturity stage? Well, those are, those are great questions because I want you to seriously evaluate where you are today along this path, along this process. I want you to think about it. And I want you to sort of put yourself where you think you are. Also, I want to challenge you to really do some of the things that we're going to talk about to take you through adolescence to the mountain of maturity. So if I could say again, here's what you need to do. I mean, here's, here's the down low. Here's the skinny on the gimme, as they say in Australia. <laughs> you've got to evaluate where you are and you've got to see where the process takes you and what you have to do to get to the mountain of maturity. But once again, we're talking about puberty. What is, what is puberty? Well, puberty is an interesting time. It's, it's that iPod blaring, Ed Hardy wearing, juicy couture comparing stage of, thank you, invincibility. <laughs> so so what, do, what do adolescents do? Adolescents, first of all, advertise their autonomy. I'm in charge. I'm running the show. I know what's best for me. When I was 15, I got my uh, permit, my driver's permit, and that meant I could drive up until 8 o'clock p.m. But the, but the deal was I had to be at home by 8 o'clock p.m. I'll never forget the first time I, I convinced my mom and dad to allow me to use mom's station wagon to take Lisa home 
after Wednesday night church. She gave me the keys and, and, and uh, church ended like at about 7 p.m. And, and I had to be in by 8 p.m. So Lisa's home was about, I don't know, 15 minutes from church. I could drop her off, then drive to 30 minutes to where we lived out in the country. So church was over and right before I left, mom said, Ed, again, your father and I want this to be perfectly clear. Be home by eight o'clock p.m. Drop Lisa off and drive straight home. Yes, ma'am. So I had the keys and the station wagon. And back in the day, this station wagon had like, I don't know, 454. I mean, this, thing, this thing was like souped up or something. You know, back, back then they overpowered everything. So, you know, I, I, I took Lisa home and I was just feeling so autonomous, so in charge. I mean, I thought, I, I was the, the, the ultimate tower of power. And, and so I, I parked the car at her house and walked her to the door. And you know, when, when, when you're, and you're just in love and everything, you start talking and gave her a couple of kisses. And time just, you know, time, you're not even thinking about time. And I glanced at my watch, 8.45. So I'm like, whoa. But you know, I wasn't that freaked because again, I'm autonomous. I'm, I'm, I'm a teenager. I'm 15. I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> who cares? So, but I did, you know, down deep. So, so I jumped in the station wagon and I'll never forget, I was racing home. And you know, sometimes when you, you know you're going to be in major trouble and you're, and you're so rebellious, you just start laughing. I was just laughing like, <laughs> I'm going to get grounded. <laughs> I'm insane. <laughs> you know, I, I, I lost my mind. And finally we got to our subdivision and, and drove in and we had this kind of a guard gate thing. There was never a guard there. I don't know why they had a guard gate, but drove through and going through all the curves. And, and, and then I passed this car. It was nighttime already. And I'm thinking to myself, that looked like my father's car. But then I'm saying, there's no way it's dad's car because dad always has meetings after Wednesday night church. So I'm driving in, I'm laughing. <laughs> You know, I'm thinking, you don't get by my mother easy. She's just a you know, pushover. I can get by her. It's no big deal. Dad might be a little bit mad, but, you know, whatever. So I drive in of our driveway and turn in, and, and I look, and Dad's car's not there. I'm like, hallelujah. So I walk inside, and my mother was, was pale. And she, she goes, Ed, where have you been? I said, Mom, I'm sorry time got away. I, I mean, I was open and honest. I said, you know, I gave Lisa a couple of kisses, and here I am. I said, uh, Dad had a meeting tonight at church? She goes, no, he went out looking for you. Ooh. And then I see the headlights on the trees coming up the driveway <laughs> on those beautiful Carolina pines, you know, and here's a car screeched to a hall, and Dad gets out, and he is so mad, he's just like shaking, you know. And my brother's with him, Ben's behind Dad going like, get it. <laughs> Dad goes, car keys. And I give him the keys. He goes, driver's license. I take my wallet out and begin to take my driver's license. He goes, just give me the whole wallet. He goes, your summer is mine. And whenever my father lowers his left eye like that, <laughs> you better head for the hills, you know. Sure enough, my summer was his, or <laughs> however you say that, because I spent some serious time doing some serious yard work. We had this big old yard, and we had this, this ginormous flower bed. I, this thing had to be 50 yards long, it seemed like. And we had this nut grass breakout. And he made me crawl on my hands and knees for I don't know how many days just pulling up nut grass. It was, it was horrendous. It was horrendous. So our, our God tells us things to do, spiritual teenagers. He says, okay, be in by 8 p.m. Okay, here are the car keys. Okay, you, you can drive the car. And what do we do? What do, what, what do teenagers do? Basically we go, you know what? I know what's best for me. I'll do what I want to do. And we'll, we'll kind of put some headphones on and do um, what we want to do, listen to who we want to listen to. Because when our will and God's will, when our desires and God's desires clash and collide, usually spiritual teenagers will do what they want to do. Now, if it is cool to go God's way, we'll do it. 
But normally, if, if, if it's a real, real intersection, we will go the way we want to go. And ultimately, spiritual teenagers will end up on our hands and knees pulling nut grass in the weed beds of life. And that's not a great place or a good place to be. So we, we do that. We have the opportunity to put the headphones on and just to drown others out. When, when Lisa and I were flying just recently, um, ha- halfway across the world, we, we had the headphones that the airline gives us out, and, and, and they have these big old things, and, and it was amazing. I could put those things on, and I could sleep, and, and, and several times Lisa was saying something to me, and I didn't really want to talk to her. I just looked at her and like, <laughs> you know? Don't tell her that, but that's what, <laughs> that's what we do with God. We, do, we just put the headphones on. We listen to our voice and what we want to listen to. And it's a sign, again, of being a spiritual teenager. Spiritual teenagers also do something else that's interesting. I think they'll, they'll put the chef's hat on and they'll, and they'll make a big old pot of gumbo. Spiritual teenagers say, you know what? I can have it all. I mean, I can't do it all. I can put a little occupation in there, a little vacation in there, a little recreation in there. I can, I can golf in the high 70s and, and be the ultimate soccer mom, or I can coach this team or that team, and we can go here and there on the weekends. And then I can take a little dash of God and sprinkle a little God in the gumbo and stir it up, and everything's good. Well, you, you, we, you can't play that game with God because you, you, you put a little, a little splash of God in there, a little, little dash of God in there. I mean, he's going to mess up, if you hear what I'm saying to you, the whole recipe. But, but I'm, just, I'm just blown away at, at, at spiritual adolescence and how spiritual teenagers do that. We have the headphones on, the chef sat on, we're just stirring our own stew, making our own gumbo, and doing our own thing and listening to our own words. Well... We do advertise our autonomy as teenagers, but also we do something else. And again, when I say we, I'm talking about spiritual teenagers. We also do something else. Spiritual teenagers realize responsibilities. I think, I think spiritual teenagers like, like stop here, press the pause button, and, we, and we, kind of look, we kind of look past the plains of puberty to the mountain of maturity. And a lot of spiritual teenagers go, you know what? I'm just going to live here in my, in my, in my 501s, my little, my little short sleeve plaid shirt, my, my black high top tennis shoes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like Jim. I'm just, I'm just going to stay here for the rest of my life because here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, count the cost. He said that count the cost. So we better count the cost and think about the implications of things. And a lot of spiritual teenagers think about what's going to happen, what they will have to do, what they will have to commit to. And it's like, I like kind of just to vacillate, you know, between the pacifier stage and the puberty stage. I kind of like this. I can just kind of, kind of, kind of be in limbo. But, but if we're in limbo and we press the pause button, we'll never discover the greatness that God has for us. Because remember, God wants to take us places we never dreamed possible. We'll never go to those places unless we go on to maturity. So to get to it, we've got to go through it. So, so, so what am I talking about when, when, I, when I say count the cost? Well, Jesus said count the cost. And, and, and those of us who want to go on to maturity, we better count the cost because there is a relational cost. Now, at this point, a lot of spiritual adolescents go, whoa, man, that's, that's pretty heavy relational cost. Uh, you, you talk to anybody and, and, and they'll, they'll talk about friendships and relationships. As, I, as I've said many times before, you can meet my best friends without ever meeting me and know what kind of person that I am. I can do the same for you. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you have or what you don't have, where you're from or where you're not from. I could talk to your friends and boom, I could know what kind of person you are. So spiritual teenagers think about the relational cost and they go, wow, this is a, this is a heavy cost. Well, here's what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14, the most unpopular verse in all the Bible to spiritual teenagers. It says, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. You go, yoked? Man, a yoke, that's a joke. You know, I'm, a, I'm an egg white person. No, no, a yoke is something else. A yoke is, is a wooden device that, that you yoke two animals to of equal strength. Animals that are like one another, like a couple of cows or a couple of donkeys or, or some oxen. If 
they are equally yoked, and obviously the yoke is tethered to a plow, you're going to be able to plow in a straight line. You're going to be able to go from what? Infancy to adolescence, from adolescence to maturity. Because this whole Christianity sport is a one another thing. So it says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Now, spiritual teenagers think about this and they go, man, I'm single. <laughs> and, this, and this verse just chopped off about two thirds of the potential candidates that I could date and marry. I don't, I don't dig this. I like, I like kind of vacillating between the infancy, the, the, the pacifier stage and, and the adolescent stage. I mean, I don't, I don't really like that. And some who, who are married are going like, whoa, I don't want my closest friends, my closest marital friends to be people who have the same divine denominator as me. I mean, I want to have a little fun, a little parte, do a little this, do a little that. And, 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 it's, and, it's, and it's tough. I mean, there is a relational cost because you're going to have fewer friends and you're going to have fewer dates. This verse does not say, because I know what you're thinking, oh, should I cut off everybody in my life who does not know Christ? No, the Bible calls us to be salt and light and leaven. The Bible calls us to penetrate a darkened world, to build relationships with people who are far away from God without compromise. It does say, though, in black and white right here, that God has our best interest in mind. That is why he tells us to have our closest comrades or, 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 or friends or people we date or whatever you want to call them, the people we hang out with, need to be believers. Because can you imagine having a deep relationship with someone you could not share that which is most near and dear to your heart with? I mean, can, can you imagine not being able to share with someone on a deeper, in the deepest level possible? Because if you're not hooked up with a, with a believer in a close relationship, it's not going to happen. There is a relational cost. Students, a relational cost. Singles, a relational cost. Those who are married, a relational cost. There's also, notice this, a time cost. <laughs> it takes some time to develop an intimate relationship with Jesus. What's the goal? Is to become the spiritual parent, to have intimacy and, and, and reproduction, to, to become unselfish, to get outside of me and think about others. Talk to any parent. And they'll tell you that. But parents will also say, you know what? I used to be cool. I used to really be cool, but the, but the teenagers made me uncool. They totally messed me up. And that's okay. As we think about others, sometimes we'll have to do things that are uncool, that then aren't the hippest things out there. We're called to do it. We're called to spend time with the Lord every day. We're, we're called to be here in this house when the church doors are open for weekend worship. We're called to serve. So there is a time cost. So there's a relational cost. Again, you better count the cost. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna tell you something that's not. No smoke and mirrors deal. You better count the relational cost and also count the time cost because you're gonna have to reallocate your time. But there's another cost. The money cost, <laughs> the finances, I mean, it's gonna cost. Again, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not playing with you today, uh, spiritual teenagers, um, and, and, and I hope you know this. I'm not talking about chronological age. I'm not saying, well, if you're 15, I'm not talking about that. Because some people who are old chronologically are teenagers spiritually or spiritual infants. Others who are young might be spiritual parents. I'm just talking about spiritual immaturity, and going from immaturity to puberty, from puberty to maturity. I'm talking about going from boy to man, 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 from girl, girl to woman, woman, woman. But there's a financial cost. Jesus talked about money so much in scriptures. He said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's gonna be. And, and, and to give you, again, the headlines, 10%. A minimum worship requirement, 10% of everything we have should go to the house. We don't give it because it's not ours to give, it's God's. We bring it. And that's just showing up to this, to this parade. That's just showing up to this process as we're going on to maturity. Because remember, 
to get to it. We've got to go through it. So spiritual teenagers count. I mean, before you get serious about this, I mean, b- before you really evaluate where you are and think about what you got to do to go to the mountain of maturity, I mean, to become this parent, think about the cost, man. Think about the relational and the, and the time and the financial cost. But here is someone else I've got to tell you. Here's the skinny on the gimme again. Are you ready for this? When I do relationships God's way, the blessings that I will accrue in my life are beyond belief. I've walked with the Lord for a long, long time, and I have the greatest friendships, marriage relationships that any man could have on the planet because by God's mercy and grace, I've done relationships His way. So I'm telling you, it works. If you doubt it, I'll just, 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 just look at me and look at many, many others here who've made this. So, so God will bless us relationally like he, he will never bless you if you do your own deal relationally. Time, <laughs> who do you think invented time? Who, who's the author of time? I didn't, you didn't, God did. So if I'm spending time with the author of time, he's gonna multiply my time daily. If I'm spending time with the author of time weekly, he's gonna multiply my time. So God will multiply it because when we spend time with him, we have an opportunity to say, God, I'm gonna take the headphones off. Uh, uh, God, I'm I'm gonna give you the chef's hat. You stir the gumbo. You tell me about priorities. You tell me about reconciliation. You tell me about relationships. You tell me about my grandchildren. You tell me about my my friends or whatever. God is going to do the deal. God, you balance this recreation and and my occupation. and, and, And God, I give it to you. I can't do it because he is in charge of the gumbo and cooking up all the food. And remember, all of God's food is delicious. You know, when, 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 when a, lot of, a lot of people who are paused on puberty, it's so true that, that when they are paused in adolescence, as they count the cost, you know, because people, you know, we're, we're pretty smart. We'll go, okay, there is, a, there is a relational cost, there's a time cost, and there's a financial cost. Here's what, here's what teenagers do, because again, teenagers are pretty bright. They'll go, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to stay here. And then they began to do something that, that, that's so interesting. They began to take pot shots at the church. Have you discovered that? Whenever someone takes pot shots at the church, they're just advertising the fact, hey, I'm a spiritual adolescent. And you know what? It's okay. Think about teenagers. Teenagers say things. I said things that... I'm I'm thinking, man, why did I say that to my parents? I was an idiot. I didn't know what was going on. So so you know what? The spiritual teenagers will say a lot of idiotic things about the church. We're parents. We understand. We love you. But, 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 But don't freak and don't follow those things. You know you're a spiritual teenager if you, if, if you make comments like this. Number one, the church is too big. I'll say it again. The church is too big. The first church I talked about last time, the Acts chapter 2 church, it, it grew to 3,000 in about 10 minutes. Well, in a very, very short time, it grew to 70,000 people in attendance. 70,000. So if you don't like big, you would not like the early church. And they had a pretty good pastor, Simon Peter. He was okay. And of course, heaven's gonna be big as well. Here's another one. This is one of my favorites. It's not deep enough. When anyone says that, they're a playpen whining, Gerber donning, nap timing infant, or they're an iPod blaring, Ed Hardy wearing, juicy couture comparing adolescent. They're saying, you know what? I can't feed myself. And, and, and usually, when, when people think they're being deep, they're actually being muddy, and I would rather be the Mediterranean than the Mississippi. So that's always been, you know, interesting. That's what my Jesus said in, in John chapter 4, verse 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Usually when people say it's not deep enough or I'm not getting fed, they, they, they're saying, I want it to be more academic. Because I think Augustine said, Augustine said, you know, I love truth that informs me, but I hate truth, he said, that challenges me and transforms me. 
Whoa. And I would much rather be informed than transformed. And I know you would as well. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Solid food. I mean, steak and lobster, all right, is for the mature. It's for the parents. You're not going to feed your, your teenager steak and lobster. You're not going to waste money very much on that. That's going to be that special time, you know. Solid food's for the mature. Who by constant what? I can't hear you. Use. Say it like you mean it. Yes. Use, the constant use have trained diet and exercise. That's what we are here. We're a diet and exercise church. Have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So in other words, solid food is for the mature, who by usage, I'm, I'm using the, the nourishment, the food is feeding my soul and it's feeding me to, to get up and do the stuff, who by constant use have trained themselves. It's like a muscle being trained to do what? To distinguish. The word distinguish here could be to discern good and evil. Adolescents, generally speaking, don't have great discernment. That is why we have so many awesome spiritual parents here at Fellowship who help the adolescents with the decisions as they negotiate the maze of life. So you know you're a spiritual teenager when you say the church is too big, when it's not deep enough. Oh, how about this one? The church is full of hypocrites. Now that's always been interesting because I've heard that a lot. And, and when, 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 when I say that, or when you say that, of course, you know you're talking to a uh, hip hopping, pimple popping, cuss word dropping teenager. But when they, thank you, when they say that, though, they're comparing themselves with someone else. By virtue of me saying that, hey, the church is full of hypocrites. How about him? How about her? I'm comparing myself with him or her. Well, well, what does the scripture say? The scripture says it's unfair to compare. The Bible says I don't compare myself with others. God doesn't grade on some cosmic curve. I compare myself to who? Jesus. It's not about others. It's about Jesus. So, I'm comparing myself with others when I say that. Secondly, the church is full of hypocrites. Right. I'm a hypocrite and you're a hypocrite. Everybody's a hip, 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 hypocrite. Because a hypocrite is somebody who says one thing and does another. I think I've done that today, haven't you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands are going up everywhere. God bless you. I see those hands. Here is the fourth reason or, or the fourth, fourth statement that when you hear this, you know you're talking to a uh, spiritual teenager. The church is only interested in my money. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jesus talked about it probably as much as anybody. In fact, it's one of the top subjects mentioned throughout Scripture. And that's why we talk about it so much because God talked about it so much. So if you have a problem with it, talk to God. Uh, but we have an opportunity because we've been blessed by God to be a river, not a dam. And, and as we bring it to the church, we can fund and finance the kingdom while God is blessing us and while we are showing God and others that he is number one. Here's another one, the fifth one. You know, you're talking to a teenager when they say, well, none of my friends are at church. You ever heard a teenager say that before? I've said that before. Mom and dad, I don't want to go. None of my friends are at church. <laughs> well, that's kind of the victim mentality. You know, we, we have a lot of martyrs and victims in today's world. I'm just a victim. I'll play the victim card, the martyr card. No one talked to me. No one noticed me. No one helped me. No one patted me on the back. No one asked me how I was doing at that church. Well, what's the antithesis of, of this mentality is to be a friend. Whatever I want, I give. So if I give it, that's what I'm going to get. So whatever I give, I'm going to get it. I share my faith, God's going to share with me. I serve in the church, God is, is going to have things to serve me. I sow, God's going to sow into my life. It, it, it's interesting. So as a parent, it's like I get outside of myself and coach and help spiritual teenagers and infants, I am going to be blessed while I'm doing this. Now, these, these are fine. It's okay to say these, these, these five things. And spiritual parents, we have to go and say, listen, listen, I understand. You're going to say things that are idiotic when you're a kid. 
when you're a teenager. We all have said them, haven't we? We've all said them, but here is, here is the bottom line of the deal. At this point, hey, spiritual teenager, what do you do? Because I've noticed that, that, that teenage runaways are, 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 a, are a problem, that the teenage, teenagers leaving the house, leaving home is an epidemic around our world today. Some teenagers at this point go, you know what? I'm just gonna leave home. And, and they scream at their parents. They, they, they turn their back on authority. They get out from under authority and they go to another house or another home because they say, you know what, mom and dad? I wanna live there because they understand me. They love me. They'll give me freedom. They'll let me do and say what I wanna do. And the moment, spiritual teenager, you get out from underneath the authority of God, your local house, you are in the elements. If you stay in the house like the prodigal son should have done, the prodigal son's problem, he left the house. If he'd stayed in the house, in the blessed place, oh man, are you realizing the inheritance? But he left the house went his own way. And I talked to so many spiritual teenagers who just leave the house. They'll go from house to house to house. And by doing so, they never reap and enjoy the blessings and the benefits of being in the house, of being coached and challenged by parents and by being carried on and moved on to maturity. So don't freak out, spiritual teenager. Don't, no, oh, I'm gonna leave because I don't understand something or whatever. Stay in it, and God will do mighty, mighty things in your life. So two things that I'm going to challenge you to do, spiritual teens, and I believe every teenager here wants to do it, to go to the mountain of maturity. Number one, it's time to manifest our maturity. To do that, I just said it, we've got to submit our lives to God's authority. Submit our autonomy to God's authority. Did you hear that? Submit our autonomy to God's authority. God has placed people in our lives, parents in our lives, pastors in our lives, coaches, teachers, et cetera, et cetera, to mold and make us into the kind of people that he desires us to become. If we get out from underneath that covering, we'll never go up. Because to go up, we gotta get under. Say it with me. To go up, we gotta get under. The second thing, it's time to break camp and to begin to climb the mountain of maturity. You, you, you begin to mountain climb, you, you, you begin to go to where God wants you to go, it's gonna cost you something. A relational cost, a time cost, a financial cost, all sorts of costs, but the cost is worth it. So, 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 so come on teenagers, it's time to move ahead. Don't, don't be Jim and, 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 and press the pause button. <laughs> Press the play button and move from boy, boy, boy to man, man, man. From girl, girl, girl to woman, woman, woman. Because when you do, you'll discover what the delicious life is all about.